Good evening. It's good to be here tonight. Uh, I had some words to say that I have usually uh, prepared some things that would be appropriate if the time arised and the need was there. But this afternoon, after the lesson that HD preached this morning, and then the opportunity presented itself to me, I've changed the things that I have prepared to say tonight. And so I hope that you listen because some of this will be a little bit of a, of a remembrance of the things we talked about this morning. H.D. brought us a lesson this morning about the war that we're all in. And he did such an eloquent job of showing us and teaching us how that we are to present ourselves and be a part of that army, part of that war, battling as soldiers. And so I thought this afternoon and I thought about those things and so tonight I want to bring us a lesson about us being in that army about us being the kind of persons that we ought to be because we are in a battle and we have to present ourselves to the world as those that are soldiers and those that are fighting in that war that's going on and so how are we to do that you see there's many times that we think it seems that we can stop warring and stop fighting. Many times people decide that they want to go on vacation from their job or just time to get away, and they forget about the war that's going on. They forget about their being a soldier. They forget about them having the responsibility to continue wherever they are and whatever they may be doing. And so there's no way that a person can take time off. There's no way that a person can go on vacation. There's no way that a person can live faithfully into God and remove themselves from the work that has set before them. You see, once you decide that you want to be a part of that army, you've enlisted in that for the rest of your life. And you have the obligation to do that. I was never in the military, I will tell you that right up front, but I know that there are rules and regulations that they have, and so is the army of God. It has things that we are to accomplish, things that we are to do, and just like it is with any kind of workplace, if the work doesn't get done, something doesn't get accomplished. In a war, if the work doesn't get done, people lose their lives. And think about that from the physical standpoint, but think about it now for this time tonight in the spiritual sense. If we don't do our part, then someone's going to die. And if we don't do our part because we're not being faithful to the Word of God, that's us that's going to die, that physical death. And we're going to be in eternal punishment for the rest of eternity. And if you can know how long that is, you have a much deeper mind and thinking than I have. And so make no mistake about it. There is an army in which we are in. As we've just heard read in our presence tonight in 2 Timothy chapter 2 in verse number 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And so we are that soldier. And a soldier must always be ready. They must be ready to go out and to do what is charged for them to do. You remember what Paul told that young preacher Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 18. He tells him, I charge this, or this I charge, he says, unto you, thou son, Timothy. So Paul referred to him as a son in the faith or a son in the gospel. So what does he charge him with? He said, according to the prophecies which went, before thee, which went before thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Again, he was telling him to fight that battle, to war that warfare that was before him. He charged him to that. Timothy was to fight that good warfare, to fight that good war in verse 18. And then in chapter 6, in verse number 12, he charges him with this, to fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. 
And so you see, for us to have eternal life, we have to fight that good fight. We have to lay hold of that and to be uh, engaged in and involved in that. We must always be persistent. Again, in the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, in verse number, uh, chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 1, he says, Thou therefore, my son, again referring to him as his son in the faith, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou unto faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, listen to this, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now then, he goes on though. He doesn't stop there and he says, No man warreth, no man that warreth entangleth himself in the affairs of this life. In other words, he's telling them not to be consumed with and tied up into things of this le- life, that he may please him that hath chosen him to be a soldier. Again, 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, chapter two. Uh, 2 verses 1 through 4 and so as we go out and as HD mentioned to us this morning we have to proclaim his word and as we studied in the book of Philippians the first chapter we have to go out and to not be ashamed of those things and to speak boldly as the Philippians were even as Paul was in prison and as Paul had defended the gospel And that's the reason he was in prison. They were still there supporting and encouraging him. And they they also were defending the gospel as it was preached to them by the Apostle Paul. And so soldiers cannot be ashamed of the very word of God. Paul told those in Rome in chapter 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And so you see, they must be ready at all times. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 8, again, Paul tells this young man, Be thou therefore ashamed, not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Don't be ashamed of his word. And don't be ashamed of the afflictions that's going to come our way when we strive to stand up for the truth. You see, being a soldier of Jesus, being a soldier of the cross, being in that great army that God has provided us with, it's not just a job. It's a very way of life. And each of us must conduct ourselves in such a way as to be appropriately accounted in that way of life. We're told by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And so we are to prove those things. We are to not be conformed to this world, be right the opposite of that, and be conformed to the very Word of God. And who are these? And this is what I want us to focus on a little bit more tonight is, who are these that are in this army? Who are the people that are uh, called and have accepted the role as a soldier in this army? Well, the Bible tells us And it's a very uh, elementary part of Christianity. It tells us that they are those that have accepted Jesus as Christ, the Lord. They're referred to as Christians. Acts chapter 11, verse number 26, says they were first called Christians at Antioch. And so they are Christians. They are the servants of God. They are the ones that have been obedient to His will and strive to live appropriately according to that. And in 1 Peter chapter uh, 4, in verse number 16, he says that we are to suffer as a Christian. Now then, in that context, he's not talking about suffering just because you've done things wrong. He's talking about suffering as a Christian because you're in obedience to his word and to the very word and will of God. 
And so the Christians, the true Christians, they are those that are obedient. They are the ones that are followers of the very Word of God. They're the ones that, uh, as Peter would refer to them in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. And so you are the one that is that obedient child. The Apostle John records for us in the book of Revelation, in chapter 22 and verse 14, Blessed are they which do His commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gate into the city. And so it's those that are in this army. It's those that are His soldiers. It's those that are true to His will that will have the opportunity to have the right to the tree of life and to enter into that final abode for the faithful. Paul makes this declaration in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 8. For ye were sometimes darkness, but listen to this, the positive side, but ye are now light in the Lord. Ye have become that light, he says. And so he tells them, he charges them to walk as children of light. Ephesians 5 and verse number 8. Because this is not just a job. I have a job. I get up and go to my job five days a week, 12 hours a day, and that's a job. But this is not a job. Being a soldier of Christ is a way of life. And we are to work and labor and be obedient to the things that he's told us to be obedient to. And so, therefore, because it's a way of life, again, there's no vacation time. You can't just take off a week or two weeks or a month or six months. You have to continually live according to and faithful to His Word. We must always be preparing ourselves. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth, knowing the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and putting those in perspective and living according to that law in which we live under now, the law of Christ, the New Testament, the Gospel. That's what we are to do. We are to grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 18. And we must all the time, as he tells, records for us in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 2, desire the sincere milk of the Word. And so we are to want to learn and to know what that will is. And so as the army of God, as His soldiers as those that's going out and battling for His cause. Tonight I want to, again, just briefly look at the character of those persons. Those that have accepted the Word. Those that are walking in that light. And how they should walk. Because you see, when you enlist in this as a role as a soldier, and you enlist in this great army of God, it's a lifelong process. And then we want to look at a pattern. We want to see how it is that we are to walk. And so when you look closely at that, there's not any way that we can waste time. There's not any way that we can lose time. We have to continue on. You see, when you lose something, you're never able to gain that back. You can gain, but you can't ever gain that lost time back. And so again, no time to take off in this battle. And so the character, the very walk of life that we are to be engaged in, what is the character of those? How are we to have our character uh, portrayed to the world and most especially to God? What is that character to be like? We are to be enlisted in this army and if we are enlisted in it, then we ought to have this right kind of character. In 1 Peter chapter 1, in verse number 13, he says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so they are to gird up the loins of their mind. What does that mean? When you talk about girding up the loins of your mind, we are to put this on. It means to encircle or to gather or to tie up, to prepare, to brace uh, as one would gird itself before they are involved in some kind of a vigorous activity. You know, in the Asian culture, 
It was the way that they would dress. And all of these uh, very thoughts and ideas means that it's just simply a way of denoting for us and preparing us for the fact that we are to have a preparation and be prepared. Again, in the Oriental custom, it was such that they would wear these flowing robes, and when they began to be involved in something, they would have to gather them up so that it wouldn't hinder them. If you read in the Old Testament, you can go all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 and verse number 11 and see that they would do that before the Passover. And so the soldiers that are involved in this great army must gather all of the thoughts and all of the feelings and all of the desires that you have within you with all of the activities that you're involved in and prepare yourselves to be the kind of example that you should be. And so anything that would hinder us from serving, anything that would hinder us from going to heaven are those things that we need to discard, that we need to put out of our lives. And so we are to prepare ourselves in that way. And there's many things that can cause us to be hindered by the very activities that we are involved in, by the very things that we are engaged in. One of the things that comes to my mind is this thing that we read about in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 15, where it says there, Whatsoever, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. And so we are to remove this jealousy and with this hatred. We are to remove fear and all of those type things from our lives because we are not to be afraid of anything. Fear not him who can kill the body, but fear him who can kill both the body and the soul. And so we are not to be fearful. We are to be brave and we are to be going forward. We shouldn't be worried about things in this life. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 27, which of, you by, uh, taking, which of you by taking thought can add one cubic to his stature? So it doesn't matter if you worry about something or not. It's not you're not going to be able to help that in that way or that cause. So don't worry about those things. God entrusts us with the ability to discern what's good and what's right. And we, going through this life, we have to be sober and vigilant about things, but not worry about those things. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse number 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother. We are to forgive people, and we are to forgive them their trespasses. And so we need to be vigilant and watching as a good soldier to prepare and have this characteristic within our lives where we can forgive those that have brought trespasses against us. And so we are to bring all of our thoughts into captivity. Isn't that what Paul said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter? 10 in verse number 5, as H.D. Uh, explained to us this morning, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing it into captivity, every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so our mindset ought to be on obeying Christ. We are to be sober. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 13, the very middle of that verse tells us to be sober. Sober means to be temperate, self-controlled, calmness of mind, serious, have sound thinking. We're not to be flying about from one side to the other. The importance of soberness, I believe, is seen because of the very number of times that the Bible refers to it. The Bible refers to being sober in so much of it, the context that we find. He talks about the qualifications for elders and bishops. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. And what does he say? A bishop must be blameless, a husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. And so he talks about as one of the qualifications for an elder is one that should be sober, calmness of mind, self-controlled, serious. Serious. 
and exhibiting sound thinking. Deacons likewise in verse 8 of that same chapter. Women are the wives of deacons and the wives of elders. Again, in the same chapter of 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 11, it says, Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. And so they too ought to exhibit that very uh, self-control and calmness of mind and serious thinking. He talks to those that are elderly in age. He talks to them and he calls them aged in Titus chapter 2 and verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith and charity and in patience. And so again, soberness, sound thinking, seriousness, a calmness of mind. But he doesn't just speak to the elders and the deacons and their wives. He speaks to all of those that are part of that army. For all of those that are engaging in this warfare as Christians. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 6-8, through 8, he says, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that are drunken, are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. There ought to be those like he talked about in 1 Peter chapter 4, and verse number 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch and pray. And who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Christians. And so we all ought to watch and be sober. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, that passage that's used so many times where he tells Christians to be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And so we are to be sober. It's so important because the Bible spends so much time telling us that we ought to exhibit this characteristic within our lives and live by that. Because that soberness helps to guard us against the fantasies and beliefs and false doctrines and things that are not in accordance with God's Word. We are to hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto uh, you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The very last part, part of 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. That hope is made possible by the very resurrection of Jesus Christ. He tells us in the very last phrase of that verse. And so it is through the hope for the, uh, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a hope for that which is not seen by us, that we patiently wait for it. And so what's the object of our hope as these that are engaged in this warfare? It's eternal salvation. It's eternal life. And it's only going to be received at Christ's coming. If we die before Christ comes again, we will be waiting until Christ comes again to receive our home with Him if we are but faithful. And so what is this walk of life consist of? There's a pattern that we ought to live by. And the first thing is that we ought to do is we're told in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 14 that we are not to fashion ourselves according to the former lust in your ignorance. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 14. Fashioning means to really assume the outward appearance of that which is around. That a fashioning means that you pattern yourself after a certain thing. And we're not to pattern ourselves as the world. We are not to pattern ourselves in that way. We know that from Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. And so we're not to pattern ourselves after the characteristics of the world. In other words, the tendency of our life should not be a tendency that's looking for the things of this life. We're not to fashion ourselves after the according to the world because, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We are to be new creatures different than our former lives and different from the lives of those that are in the world. 
not to be proud or arrogant or any such thing, but to live in such a way as to be pleasing unto God. So you put off that old man and you put on the new man, Ephesians 4, verses 20 through 24. Colossians 3, verse 9 and verse 10 says, Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So it's renewed in that knowledge of the one that created us, God. And so we are to put that on. We are to set our affections on something much different than this life. For if we be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on the things above, not on the things of this earth. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 and verse number 2. You see, we're commanded to do that. Romans 12, verse 1 and verse 2. Be holy in all manner of conversation. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15. We are to be holy. We are to be sanctified. We are to be have that sanctification. All of these have about the same meaning. It's a separation from the life of habitual sin and all worldly defilement. defilement. We are to be separate from that and live accordingly. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 22 through 26, Israel was told there to be holy unto the Lord. And we are too also are to be holy. And so there are many, many reasons why as soldiers in God's army we are to be holy. Isaiah chapter 35 and verse 8 says, And a highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools shall err therein. Isaiah 35 and verse number 8. We are to present our bodies a living sacrifice, as H.D. spoke to us about. Romans 12 and verse 1. Our bodies are to be such that we are to live accordingly each and every day of our lives. And when we stumble, we are to pray for forgiveness of those things. But we are to continue to walk in the light as He is in the light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through verse number 9. And we are to perfect holiness in our lives. Because you see, he says, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness and fle of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse number 1. So we've been chosen in him when we have accepted him as our leader, as our savior to be holy and without blame, Ephesians 1, verse 4. Because the Lord wants a church. He wants His body. He wants that army by which make up His church because we are His servants. And He wants that to be that which is without spot or blemish. It says that He might present to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it said that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5 and verse number 27. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 7 says, For God hath not called us unto uncleanliness, but what? What does He call us to? Unto holiness. 2 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 7. And so without holiness, the Hebrew writer tells us that we cannot see God. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which... No man shall see the Lord. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 14. The one that has called us to be holy, that's the one we should imitate. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15 says, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. And conversation in the Bible, in the New Testament, doesn't talk about us verbally con uh, conversing one with another. It talks about our manner of life the way we live and conduct ourselves. Because, you see, we are a holy priesthood, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. We are a holy nation, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. And it doesn't matter if you're young. Go back to Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1. Let no man despise you because of your youth or whether you're middle-aged. 
or whether you're older in years. All of this applies, and you can't take off from being that person that is a soldier of Christ. You can't take vacation. You can't uh, decide that you don't want to uh, be a part of that. You must continue on each and every day. So as we fight this war, we are to have a certain characteristic about us. And so those that have enlisted in this war, this army, they have a great responsibility. And there is a responsibility to walk in God's appointed ways. John chapter 12 and verse 48, Jesus says, The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge you in the last day. We're going to be judged by his word. Not by what we think, but by his very word. Every man's going to receive that reward according to the deeds that he has done. Romans 2 verse 6. And so we must, we must speak things with patience because of this eternal life. And we must seek that because we seek after that eternal life. Romans 2 verse 7. John chapter 14 and verse number 15 says we are to keep his commandments. John chapter 15 and verse 14 says we are always friends if we do whatsoever he commands us. And we're also told that we must uh, keep his commandments. But you know, those commandments... They're not grievous. He tells us that they're not in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3. Because you see, there's the very fact of what Jesus has done for us in creating that body or that place by which we can be a soldier and war this battle. We are to walk in the old paths. As Jeremiah says in Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse number 16, he says, Where is the good way? And so, you see, we are to live according as he would have us to live. Not as the flesh, not as this world, but as the way we should be a part of his life. Therefore, because of these characteristics that we must possess in our lives, because this is a lifelong journey, it's required. There's no time to exit. There's no time to sit on the sideline. There's no time not to be engaged in this army with God and for His purposes. Tonight, if there's someone here that's not a Christian, you're not one of His soldiers. You've not begun that journey to wage that warfare as He would have you to. And so the Bible tells us that we must hear the Word because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the very word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. And then that we must believe that he is who he said he was, John 8, verse 24, John 3, verse 16. And then we must repent of those things that are amiss in our lives. And if you're not a child of his, you must repent because you've not been obedient to his word. Luke 13, verse 3, Luke 13, verse 5, Acts 3, verse 19. And then we must confess his name before men, that good confession, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse number 12. For it's with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation, Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. And then John chapter 1, verse 12 says, Then you have the power to become a child of His. Then you can be baptized, be buried with Him in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. That baptism. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But if you are a child of God, but you've taken time off from this journey, time off from this war, you've sat on the sideline, then you need to pray God if perhaps the thought of thy heart might be forgiven thee. Acts 8 verse 22. And he's faithful and just to forgive you. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 through 9. And you can begin that walk again in, in his favor and in good standing in his sight. Because you're striving to live in the light and walk in the light and be obedient to His Word. And so as the opportunity now presents itself, the time is yours, the sermon is yours. I hope that you have gotten something from this because it, it meant a great deal to me as my thinking today, as my uh, mind went forth to this, that we are to war and engage ourselves. But we need to know how we are to conduct ourselves in this war, in this battle. So if you have any need of any of us for anything, prayers or help,
Won't you come as together we stand and say?